Okay, hi everyone. Um, I'm going to get things started whilst people are still uh, joining. Um, but it's really lovely to have you all here. I'm so pleased to welcome you on behalf of Exeter's Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies to this workshop um, by Dr. Jad Jabir, Queer Immigrant Regeneration, Healing Through Global South Communities. Dr. Jad Jabir is Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Access Employment. They're also the founder of the Marginalized Majority, a non profit LGBTQIA 2S plus community-led organization that focuses on social research for queer people with experiences of marginalization and creates culturally nuanced workshops and training sessions on equity, diversity and inclusion. Jad is a member of Toronto Pride's Board of Directors and of the 2S LGBTQ plus advisory board for Toronto City Council. Jad has a PhD in gender dynamics and queer behavior pertaining to racialized and cultural global South identities and is the author of Queer Arab Mata, published by Atropos Press, an autoethnographic exploration of queer Arab sexuality. They have lectured at the University of Toronto and the Lebanese American University, among other institutions, on topics including queer theory, gender dynamics, and immigration studies. And I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that Jad is here today to deliver this workshop and share some of the themes arising from their longstanding work with marginalized queer people and the healing strategies developed by and for those communities. Um, so, Jad, I hand over to you. I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Hi, Hannah. Thank you, everyone, for being here, and thank you so much for this wonderful session. I will start off the session primarily by saying that this space is for us to connect and collect. So please do not hesitate to share your knowledge in the chat. Anything about yourself that you would like to share safely, kindly um, do that. Um, as I start off with a small land acknowledgement and introducing uh, the session and my work, I will ask please um, Hannah and whoever can to show the PowerPoint presentation in the background. Um, the point of us doing this is that time is a little bit limited. So while I'm doing the land acknowledgement and the self-introduction, a few themes are going to be going in the background. These themes are connected to some artwork. So as I'm doing that, kindly look at those themes and see if any of these themes resonates in your heart, resonates in your soul. Keep record of those themes so that we can come back to it after the first part of the workshop is done. So I'm gonna start off with a land acknowledgement. Most of us here are settlers on this land, Canada, including myself. We acknowledge the colonial pain inflicted upon the indigenous people of this land. We also acknowledge that the land on which we operate on has for thousands of years been the traditional land of more than 630 First Nation communities in Canada. 50 nations and 50 indigenous languages exist on this land. We acknowledge the harms of the Indian residential schooling system. And I will put this in the chat so that anyone who does not know about the history of this in Canada can get the right information. Of course, we also acknowledge the mistakes that have been done in respecting and holding space for indigenous populations in Canada. And um, we also acknowledge the mistakes that have been done and the harms that have been done through the Atlantic slave trade and we pay, pay respect to our BIPOC and POC populations that exist in this part of the world. My name is Jad Jabir. As Hannah mentioned, I'm a postdoctorate researcher. I will, from the beginning of the session, put in my expertise, and I hate the word expertise, I will put in my knowledge for you to ask me anything um, uh, from the beginning of the session to the end, any type of explanation on any notions anything that you're interested about, Swana, Arab, Muslim, Arabness, queerness, and gendered behavior, kindly do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, Marginalized Majority is a registered nonprofit organization. We create weekly drop-ins for the community. So if this session makes you feel emotionally judged or emotionally anything, um, we have a weekly free drop-in um, on Saturdays at 10 a.m. EST for you to follow up with us and for us to connect you to healers and to like-minded community members. Um, rules of safe space. We protect this space from homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, ableism, and all other forms of isms and phobias. Anyone who inflicts this kind of emotional violence on any of our presenters or participants will be asked to be removed from this space. We also hope to engage you in your collective trust um, being that these emotional stories and sensitive issues that we're sharing 
hopefully will remain within the Zoom room. Uh, also, please be mindful that we are recording. Uh, this session is being streamlined. So if you need to rename yourself and not show video in order for you to ask questions or to get the proper knowledge safely, kindly do that. I will also be adding keywords when, 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 when capable in the chat so that you can save um, those keywords. Okay, so let's start about framing the workshop. And let's start talking about our automatic coping mechanisms. Hopefully now you've seen those slides, you've seen those notions of survivor's guilt, acceptance versus tolerance, queer the verb. So maybe Hannah, if you can kindly stop the PowerPoint now and just um, pin me in the middle and I will start speaking about for us queer people, what are our automatic coping mechanisms? So for now, everyone please in the Zoom room, we step away from your corporate problems. We step away from your career goals. We step away from your material possessions around you, like your home or your financial problems. We step away from everything exterior to us and we take a step inside. So wherever you are, please, I want you to sit back, close your eyes, and I want you to take a deep breath. And one more, please. And one more, please. And I want you to take notes of your senses. We step away from contexts when we're not really absorbing or permeable, when you're just functioning, when you're just getting things done, and we move to this moment now. We are taught to live in hyperfunctionality and then take this one therapy session once in a while. And we are taught to rely on our automatic emotional coping mechanisms. But really, there's nothing automatic about them. Our emotional coping mechanisms need a lot of conscious work and editing. They need awareness. So I always think we're all here. We all have different emotional coping mechanisms to survive. So I will ask you now a question and ask you to engage in conversation in the chat. When you felt heartbroken, or traumatized by something. What happened to you? Can you tell me in the chat, please? How was your emotional reaction? Did you cry? Did you ignore? Miriam, who has the same family name as me. Yes! My mind always resorts to shutting down at first. Excellent. So your mind is shutting down, imploding, disassociation. Thank you, Sabiha. I eat. Absolutely. Pain, physical pain, which is known as somatic pain, by the way. That's why in healing, when we talk about healing, we heal somatically. Many of us feel discomfort and emotional pain in our stomachs, in our chest. Withdrawing into self, isolation, isolation. So I want you all as well to be looking at these comments. This is your community. This is what the people around you react through their hearts and souls, right? Withdrawing, isolation, freezing freezing so don't remember don't forget that we always speak about fight or flight don't forget fawn we fight flight or fawn many of us have been nurtured to freeze in our bodies emotion couldn't blink or breathe thank you so much sumaya for that disconnection yes madness shutting down emotional outrage my perception and natalie my perception of emotionality shuts down Absolutely. So as you can see, folks, there is a theme. There is a common theme here. There's a common denominator 
which all of us deal with over here. So now I will share with you what in my past 11 years of doing this work, I have also connect, collected from the community of their emotional reactions. Someone said, I had to unlearn. I had to derealize. Someone said, I had a panic attack. One of the participants' emotional reaction was shingles. There was a lot of pain in the stomach, pain in the heart, bodily pain. So there's been a lot of that. So if you feel that when you're feeling emotional, know you're not alienated. Know that a lot of people feel their emotions somatically. Someone also said, I felt I needed to control, just control. Someone said, I felt trauma. And a very common theme was consumption. In the chat, someone said, here, I ate. So that's a very common theme. Consumption, consuming food, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is. Okay, so now that we've asked this question about what your automatic emotional coping mechanisms is, is I will ask you something else. What, you, what, you, what would you say were your constructive emotional coping mechanism? So if you had someone that you love and you were telling them, hey, here's my best practice. Here's what I do when I'm feeling bad. And this is what I would like to pass to you. What would that be? Can you start typing that in the chat? Your best emotional coping mechanism, your best practices so that we share with each other, so that we learn from each other. Yes, Nicole, 100% writing down and acknowledging what I'm feeling. That has a very specific term, which I really love. It's called transmutation, okay? And it's about transmuting your energy, transmuting your emotions. My advice for queer people is never hoard your emotions. Never isolate and hold on to your emotions by themselves in their raw form. Always transmute, always try to change the nature of your emotion into something, into art, into writing, into dance, into some form of creativity or any form that suits your emotional body. But remember, don't hoard your emotions, don't isolate in them, and always transmute. Your emotions are energy and their nature can be changed. Stephanie mentioned, embrace a consciousness of what you are feeling. Take time to recognize it. Absolutely. Don't be afraid of your emotions. Remember that the best way to deal with your emotions is to create some form of distance from them. And the way to do that is through monitoring your internal language, your language in your head. So get rid and be gone of terms that say, I am depressed, I am sad, I am lonely, I am. Instead, use the term feel to discern and create distance between you and the emotion. So I feel sad, I feel lonely, I feel isolated. Remember, you are the witnessing conscious body. You are the person witnessing those emotions. You are the shoreline and your emotions come upon you and leave. You are the witnessing consciousness. It is the same witnessing consciousness from when you were a queer child at five years old, a queer young adult at 12, a queer teenager. It's been the same witnessing consciousness. Go back to that. That witnessing consciousness is not your emotional body. Distance yourself from it. Practice that internal language. And remember, you are not your emotions. Talk. Thank you, Sabiha. That's so important. Talking is so important. Not isolating in your emotions is so important. Open communication, reflection, and honesty. I would say self-honesty as part of honesty. Breathe. Focus on the present. Absolutely. Breathing exercises really help you out because they hone you back to what your body simply just does with or without your consciousness. Your body is equipped to survive and breathe. 
your body is equipped to self-preserve and enjoy pleasure and be in its present moment. So breathing is a great form of practicing how to be involved in your present. Amelia, I talk to myself and go through the stages I went through. Amazing. Understanding the negative thoughts and changing the dialogue. Perfect. So Amelia, what you're doing is you're identifying your internal language. You're identifying that internal voice. And the best way, many people are like, what? My internal voice? How do I hear that? The best way to identify your internal voice, I call it, it's in the drop the water on your laptop moment. Or when you have these very critical moments when you're trying to do so hard and so well, and then something happens, like you mess up. And then at that moment, listen to your inner voice. Listen to it. Is your inner voice telling you, oh, you stupid Jad, drop the water right now in this very critical moment? Or is your inner voice telling you, it's okay, Jad, you know, water just drops sometimes. So what? Things are going to happen. So how you identify your inner voice is in those internal conflict moments, those high, hard moments, catch your inner voice, catch it then and there and make sure it's so kind to you. If your inner voice is not so kind and forgiving, no matter what you achieve on the outside, nothing's going to help. Okay, Mariam, I would ask them to take it easy on themselves. Yes, trying to understand their emotions and share it with people they feel safe with. Thank you. Natalie, allow without self-judgment my processing of my experience. Absolutely, take your time processing. Amelia, putting on loud music and dancing. Yes, you know what? All of us have an inner child and that inner child has notions of how to be in the present. Whether your inner child used to play Lego, whether your inner child used to just dance, whether your inner child used to remain in isolation and watch art, whatever it is, there is a certain situation that you can create around you that will give you a sense of safety, a deep sense of safety. Connect to that. Whether it's burning incense or surrounding yourself with your toys, so to say, or surrounding yourself with your objects of affection, do that. Create your safe environment. Staring into natural space, absolutely. Distracting yourself through a number of things. Thank you, Alba. I'm reading what Liam said, expressing yourself privately. So nature is healing. Absolutely, nature is healing, 100%. Because nature is eternal. It's beyond us. It's beyond our current conflicts. Journaling is excellent. So folks, this list on the chat is for you to keep and for you to archive. One of these things has to work for your emotional body. One of these things that mentioned has to work for you. And follow it through. Similarly to the previous part, I will now share with you what the healthy coping mechanisms of the community are that I've been collecting from the community for the past 10 years. Journaling was a big thing. And this is another quote from a person. I understood that the process of healing from PTSD is never linear, but cyclic. And there is no shame in healing, then rehealing and starting the process over and over again every morning. From that quote is how I named this workshop, Queer Regeneration, because this is how we regenerate emotionally, mentally. Don't you feel shame about waking up every morning and bringing yourself up to point zero? Don't feel shame about that. That is the process of healing. That is what we do, especially us who have been harmed systemically and deeply as queer children. Let's give another healthy emotional mechanism. I felt my way through it. I allowed myself to feel and grieve. Here's another one, which I mentioned before. I discerned or put distance between me and my emotions. Another one, I found ways to disconnect, but not isolate. So this is very important. If you like to disconnect, there's a very fine line between disconnecting and isolating. 
do not isolate. Do not isolate. And the difference is, difference is, it's an emotional difference. When you disconnect, you come to a moment when you know your body is done disconnecting. But when you are in perpetual isolation, you'll come to a moment when your emotional body knows it's done disconnecting, but you're still stuck in your isolation. That is dangerous. Isolation is very, very dangerous for marginalized queer people. Another thing, another best practice is I named and I identified my emotions. That's a good thing. Try to identify your emotions. If you're just feeling a kind of way, sit down and be like, you know what? That kind of way emotion, I want to identify it. I want to say what it is. Is it restlessness? Is it discomfort? Is it anxiety? Is it loneliness? So name and identify your emotions. Another best practice is I connected with like-minded community members. For example, and I quote, as a Southeast Asian non-binary Muslim, I find I found a community similar to mine who had shared similar experiences. Another quote, for me, journaling and writing felt like labor. So I video journaled myself. When I can't write, I turn on my video and I have conversations with myself and I hear myself speak and I record my train of thoughts. Finally, the last thing, last best practice is, I created thinking, meditative, safe spaces for myself. For example, that person mentioned taking calming baths. But your thinking, meditative, safe space can be based on what your emotional body is. Okay, everyone. This was the first short section of emotional best practices. So I hope that helps. I can see a few smiling faces. I appreciate you and thank you. And now I'm going to move into the cultural history of self-work. So this section is basically telling us that for thousands of years, cultures used to make time to meditate and connect. A fiun, a fiun was used in the Arab Gulf, which is a form of opiate for thousands of years. Pot was chewed in Yemen. Ayahuasca was used collectively in South America. Psychedelic mushrooms were used all over. Each culture, and the point of me telling you this, is that each culture took its time in creating rituals, sometimes supplemented by psychedelic psychedelics, sometimes by sobriety, to experience what was considered sacred and simple activities, such as stargazing or dancing around the fire. There was a time collectively designated for healing. Now, I want you to imagine this type of ritual in our 2S LGBTQ plus community. Just imagine the same way we call each other on Thursday and Friday night and be like, hey, what's happening? Where do you want to go to this, this pub, this club, this place? Imagine we call each other on Friday night and be like, hey, what's happening on the emotional healing front this weekend? What are you up to? Do you want to go for a stargazing night with some community members? Do you want to sit and heal in a collective situation? So... This is a good wake-up call for you to kind of create these healing community spaces with each other and make time for this. A nice thing that I remember is that Native American cultures like the Apache in Mexico tapped into this world of collective healing and supplemented it with botanicals like sage and willow and cactus. And they created this wonderful ritual called uh, the burden basket ritual, which were small woven baskets and they were used to provide a physical and symbolic container for worries, concerns, and mental burdens. So I did a group thing over here in my house three weeks ago with burden baskets, where we all went around and put our burdens in our baskets. And it was very healing. So what happened? What happened with this collective time designated for healing? Easiest thing to look at is what we see nowadays on social media, right? The value of life stopped being 
by these number of wonderful revelations that a person can have. You know, Buddha had all his revelations under a cherry tree and then disseminated an entire philosophy that lasted thousands of years. And now we kind of see something different, you know, number of followers, cars, representation, which tells you that in modern times, unless you as queer individuals willfully, intentionally, and courageously, fearlessly carve out me time, me time, self-healing time, a whole life will pass by before you actually self-actualize and really learn how to be present in your present. Workaholics are the best example of people that don't know how to carve me time. They're obsessed with their work and they think that the value of their work is the value of who they are. This is why when workaholics have a problem at work, their whole psychology crashes, their entire emotional body crashes, their mental health crashes, because they have built their self-worth through that one lens. Serial monogamists are the same <laughs> because serial monogamists obsess about the containment of the relationship and its security, but they forget about their partner. And this is where hopefully I can introduce you the hexagon theory before 11.30 kicks in so that we can have the last 30 minutes to go over the themes. The hexagon theory is something that helped me out so much in my life and tells you that your life should be made up of multiple different diverse sides that intersect harmoniously at key points, but not, not a single continued side that links back to itself to create a circle. The workaholic archetype, the activist archetype, the serial monogamist archetype, any person that focuses and zhuzhs and creates their life around that one notion is going to exist in that circle. Sometimes that's, sometimes that's faith, sometimes that's your partner, sometimes that's your job, your children. Point is, when that one side crashes, like a domino effect, everything else crashes. So, separate those sides, make sure you have a side that is, for example, for your physical health, another is for your mental health, another is for your social health, another is for your passions, another is for your career, so that if one side crashes, you still have the emotional safety of other sides existing. And remember, the hexagon isn't perfect. You can always tweak it left and right. So I hope that really helps. Okay, so everybody, now is the time when I can maybe, Hannah, take just a few more minutes, pass that PowerPoint in again, take a little breather. <laughs> and I'm going to give you two minutes just to kind of go over these notions, see which one again re resides in your soul. And then we can bring these themes up and discuss them for the next half an hour. I think the last 10 minutes would be a Q&A. Just to tell you, these themes came up from the community. So from having done thousands and thousands of consultations, I noticed that there are common denominators that we as queer global South people deal with. Okay, I think this is pretty clear. So I'm gonna ask you now, you know, to start typing in the chat, what emotional concepts resonate with you and we can start going through them. Acceptance versus tolerance. Okay. If you don't mind, Nicole, and you're comfortable enough, and it's possible for us to do this, would you mind unmuting and telling us why acceptance versus tolerance resonated in your heart? I think what came to mind, um, you know, when, even when you're lucky enough to have family, like, okay, 
I don't understand queerness, but okay, we love you. But through their actions, through how they speak to you, there isn't quite an acceptance. There's maybe a begrudging tolerance, even if that is there and you still feel lucky. Like, okay, I still have family, I guess, but there's still, it's not there. Thank you so much for that. Honestly, I just couldn't have, I couldn't have said it better. So, you know, just the idea that putting these notions like this and someone just coming in and describing them so accurately tells you that these notions really are from the community for the community. So thank you so much for that example. For this section, I will now be sharing a few quotes from my research on marginalized queer people. I'm going to give a trigger warning, trigger warning. These quotes might be emotionally heavy, but these quotes are mostly from parents addressed towards their queer children. This is how right, this is how right you got it. Um, this is how right you got it. Uh, sorry, I forgot what your name was just to pass by right now. So these are the quotes. First quote, I don't care if you're gay but don't dress this way when you see me. Quote number two. I accept you, but if you ever get married, if you ever have a queer marriage or bring a queer partner here, I will kill you both. Third quote. I accept the gays because I like you, but I find them disgusting. Fourth quote, I will accept you, but tell me if anyone else's children were queer, do you think their parents would even have them or be happy about them? So these are examples of reactions from family members towards their children. If you can kindly in the chat, tell me what you find in common about those reactions. Yes, thank you, Aurel. Yes. 100% exceptionalism, 100%. Yes, yes, Maryam, 100%. Their reactions feel shallow. They don't feel real, 100%. Non-acceptance and blame. Yes, there seems to be some form of unconscious or subliminal blame over here. So, folks, when you have a fly that's flying around your face, you can handle the fly for one minute, two minutes, three minutes, but at some point you're going to smack that fly. And this is the feeling that we Global South children grow up feeling. We grow up feeling tolerated. And our inner queer child, when we grow up in these family households, our inner queer child is unheard and unwitnessed. So the type of relationship formation we are nurtured to create is called eggshell relationships. We are nurtured in that mindset to create eggshell relationships with our families, with our friends, even with our own identities. And I call them eggshell, obviously, because they're so fragile. Anything might break them. Many of us come out to our loved ones to gain closeness, but we don't really get that feeling of family love or of acceptance, which we came out for to begin with. That feeling of not really being able to call your mom or dad or partner or someone if your partner cheated on you or call them if someone called you a bad word, a homophobic word, or someone made fun of how you walked or the arc of your hand they are not here for us for these queer support moments. 
So I always ask queer people, what do you want to be grateful for? Grateful for tolerance? I wouldn't want you to be grateful for tolerance. So I would tell you, primarily as a queer person, if it is safe enough for you to do so, you need to sharpen, sharpen your emotional intuition to know when you are being tolerated and when you are being accepted. Underlying sharpening this intuition is for you to really believe that it is your right at all times to push for full acceptance. There is a deep danger in living out your identity while feeling tolerated, as many of us have done. And the danger of that is because you always come from a space of negotiation. When you're feeling barely tolerated, you're always negotiating. You're never really asserting. I know marginalized people that have spent lifetimes negotiating. We negotiate because we come from fear, because we are afraid to establish clear statements and implement clear actions. And we have internalized these negotiations from our family and friends. Being in a relationship where you are feeling tolerated, and I will end it with this, is a form of informal conversion therapy. If you are with your family members and your loved ones, and you are constantly feeling tolerated, and yourself is constantly being subconsciously resisted on some level, and you are having to find yourself constantly revalidating and explaining your truth, then you are experiencing a form of emotional conversion therapy. Okay. I hope that helps. Let's look at another notion. So give me another notion, folks. I'm trying to see if anyone typed anything else in the chat. Activism and cancel culture. Ooh. All right. So let me go to that section. Activism and cancel culture started from a very interesting event that happened in the community. Um, one of the folks that I know, um, so first I will ask you a question, better before I start with an emotional ethnography. Um, have you ever done something as an activist or advocate that you thought was benefiting the community, but turned out it was harming it more, the community and yourself? Okay, I'm gonna give you a small example, which is what I wanted to start with. One person that I was working with um, suddenly one day posted the results of their HIV status on their Facebook. I was very surprised. That person was trying to post those results as a form of showing, hey, I don't care. HIV isn't tabooed. I don't care if it's positive or negative. But that person in that post was also saying that he had been accused by one of his partners of cheating and being positive. So he was also posting the results as a proof of him being loyal to his partner. The point that I'm trying to get is that when that person posted that, what they actually did is they harmed a lot of people that did not have the opportunity of having those same results. And they were also giving a message that you can be coerced 
and you can be forced to show your HIV results on your Facebook, on your social media. What that person was trying to do was alleviate the taboo of HIV, but what he ended up doing is harming more people who might be positive, who are going through this experience. The point of this section is that being conscious of our language as activists is so important. We work in identity politics and language is, as I always say, formative, which means that the language that comes out of your mouth forms or breaks connections. The language that comes out of your mouth does not go into vacuum. It goes into people's emotional bodies. It goes into people's emotional histories. It can either create safe space or it cannot. Better to use safer space. Safe space is no longer a term we use because we can never really confidently assure people, queer people, safe spaces. So when you speak and your language, your language is again going into people's emotional bodies. So it is very important that we don't end up in our language getting polarized into cancel culture whereby we don't want to understand each other's opinions, but we want to cancel each other's opinions. That usually happens through online language, through online violence. We don't want our activist language to harm us or harm another people. We want it to always come from a space of understanding intersectional inequalities. That means that another queer people might be having a whole other queer journey than you. You might meet queer people that need to be, that have issues against non-binary folks. You might meet trans folks that have issues against as well other trans and non-binary folks. We need to understand that we are in a culture where a lot of people have been harmed and where a lot of us have not received the right healing. So, Harmed people harm people, okay? Victims victimize others. So be aware of that. We are in a culture where many of us are easily triggered and many of us have not gone on their healing process yet. And many of us are functioning from that inner hurt queer child, not that queer adult that has gone through these experiences. We're literally functioning from that queer child. Okay. Let's look at imposter syndrome for that last theme. Wait, I'm reading Maryam's point. When I thought that activism meant pushing, forcing other people to participate in the work. Wow, Maryam, that is so deep. Thank you for saying that. You cannot push other people to do this work, Maryam, because the process of learning and unlearning is a very difficult process. So the best example of that is what is now known as white fragility. For a lot of white folks, when you are passing them through the process of unlearning their biases or just letting them know, and I'm a white passing Arab, so I acknowledge that, and Arabs have a lot of anti-black and a lot of racist notions at hand. But for a lot of, a lot of us, we have to understand that the learning and unlearning process is a dangerous process where a lot of conflict can happen. So my advice for you is if you are going through this on a professional level, on a higher level, make sure that you are surrounded by healers, Global South healers, anti-conflict resolutionists, people that have experience in working in the learning and unlearning process. And unfortunately, many of, many of us have to push this activism, and I call it micro-activism, with our families, with people around us, with people that we love. I would just tell you that if you are in this process of educating people around you, um, then acknowledge the emotional labor of that. If you're there to spending time with your auntie or with your cousins, and you know, you know you're helping them through their microaggressions, acknowledge that once you're done with that, you probably need to wrap that up and go do something super queer. 
or go do something super healing because what you've done that explaining to others is emotional labor. It's hard on our emotional bodies. Okay. Imposter syndrome before we move to the Q&A. So imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is simply the feeling that you are an imposter. You are an alien. This feeling can happen within yourself while staring at the mirror and can also happen collectively in a social setting amongst other people. So the first thing that I will tell you about imposter syndrome is that it might be something that is external that you feel with other people, but it's something that we also internalize. So eventually it seeps into your consciousness and unconsciousness. So how do you really, how, how is imposter syndrome plays out in your body somatically? So it's that feeling that silences you just when you're about to speak and have your voice heard. That sweat, armpit, can't breathe just when you're about to speak and you're telling yourself, what is happening? I, I just want to say something. Like I, I just want to express myself. Why am I facing all these internal psychological barriers? It's the voice that's telling you it's not your place to speak. It's the voice that's telling you, even if you speak, these people are never going to understand you. It's the voice that's telling you, even if you're going to speak and they're going to hear what you have to say, they're probably going to think less of you. What don't we know about the imposter syndrome? This is what we don't know, is that the imposter syndrome is often in itself inherited and internalized from our parents and our culture. For example, I grew up in a culture that always told me, what are you doing? Keep your head down low and do the work. You don't need to rattle any cages. Just do the work. What are you doing raising your voice? Lower your head. Do the work. Good things will come to you. Don't bother people. Don't mess with the system. So growing up in this keep your head down low and do the work, which is how my parents were raised themselves. I learned how to fear my own voice. I learned how to just go along and not causing trouble. But we need to cause trouble, good trouble. We need to cause good trouble. So my parents passed this fear, this imposter syndrome, especially mothers, especially because there's a gender factor here. They passed on this fear to me on how to be extra cautious, but also extra productive. Work really hard, but in silence to pass. Imposter syndrome also, very importantly, comes in the way you feel towards your own creativity, your own work, your own outputs. So even after you've written your paper or drawn that painting or finished that project, you are going to feel like your work is not enough. And that is your own internalized imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome also disseminates and is internalized in our own body, especially the way you feel towards your body when the bodies around you in the queer community don't look like yours. And when your aesthetic doesn't fit into the prescribed aesthetics of your community. Gay culture is the biggest example. Just look at TikTok. You know, if you're not a white fixed twink with six packs, then you've kind of fell out of the <laughs> categorically of what is globally attractive for queers. We know that looks are dominated by standards of white beauty. And when you don't look like that, even in the mirror, sometimes you feel an imposter in your own body. This is what I'm going to tell you about imposter syndrome. It can affect your life in detail. So, for example, when you're asking for compensation or when you're expecting that equal, equal back and forth um, from people, let's imagine uh, I gave Hannah... Um, a paper and Hannah told me for that paper, she's going to give me this body of knowledge. 
when I'm giving her that paper, my imposter syndrome is going to kick in by saying, mm, that paper is not good enough. And do I deserve to get paid for this? And do I deserve for Hannah to return back that equal amount of energy for my equal amount of energy? So your imposter syndrome plays into your poverty consciousness. Poverty consciousness. I will tell you this to wrap this part up. The fair exchange that you are scared to establish, that fair exchange between you and your employer, you and your friend, you and your partner, is not just an exchange of these small things that you're doing, an exchange of goods or money. It's an exchange of effort and energy. It is telling yourself, I deserve this equal amount of energy, love, appreciation, and monetary value for this amount of effort. So I hope this section helps you um, to heal this section. I'm going to put this. I'm just going to put it in the chat because I feel it really helps. Remember, my lovely friends, that you are enough in your resting state. Always tell yourself that. There is nothing you need to do to be enough. Waking up in the morning and enjoying your body and enjoying your mind and being present in your emotions is enough to make you the king, queen, non-binary subject of your world. It is enough to make you that. So keep telling yourself, I'm enough in my resting state. I am valuable and validated and I am safe. And I will now leave the last few minutes for the Q&A. Ask me anything, comment about anything, just say anything that's in your heart. Hello. Oh, hi. Oh, sorry. Yes. I don't know if it's okay for me to just talk. Is it, is, okay? it is okay. okay. Please go I ahead. I tried to put my video on, but I don't think it's coming up. Oh, well. Um, so, first of all, I want to say thank you with everything you said. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, like you're just so lovely and nice really really nice I've been sat here being like oh <laughs> for the whole entire thing and um, my research so I'm a PhD student at the moment my research is very close to the work that you've kind of described mm -hmm. um, and my personal experience is I am queer non-binary and I come from a British South Asian family um so oh there we go that's it Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, and um so kind of personal experiences I left home for surviving and all that kind of stuff and um, and I've worked on myself a lot to heal from that and to kind of get rid of those negative thoughts and change my mindset learning and unlearning what I want to ask is you as a person who researches within queerness and marginalized communities I'm guessing you also have your own experiences of that and hurts and pain from the past. How do you separate that from when you are working with participants who are kind of talking about their own stories? How do you not take that away with you or internalize it yourself? Excellent question. You know, working so much with the community, sometimes I would um, come in with the best community proposal, with the most helpful thing that I can present. But when I come in and my energy on the inside is not healed and I'm not feeling well on the inside, then even if my intention and attention to my intention to help, what I end up doing unconsciously is harm. Because I will end, be, end up in the situation where things bubble up within me and then language takes over and I end up harming. So my rule about working with the community is even if you think you want to do well, if you're going into these spaces and you're not feeling well and you haven't done whatever makes you heal, whether it's that half an hour of meditation or playing that game or taking time doing this, if you haven't done whatever brings you into that community with that healed soul, then you might inflict more harm on others than you might think. 
also it is constant work, Emilia. So as I mentioned, you know, um, never feel shame from going through that cyclic process of having to heal over and over and over again. Um, I wake up in the morning and my to-do list between 7 a.m. and 8 is 10 things. And the way I've built up those 10 things is through living and knowing that, oh, I need to do this for my energy. I need to do this to that or else. So one small exercise that I can ask you to do is when you wake up in the morning, as crazy as it sounds, try to identify your thoughts as negative or positive. I know it's very reductionist. I know it's much simpler said than done. But just when you wake up and you're washing your teeth or whatever you're doing in the morning, tell yourself, oh, I'm thinking a positive thought now. Or, oh, I'm thinking a negative thought now. And teach yourself, tell yourself, I don't want to hold in negative thoughts in my body. I don't want to keep these negative things in my body. So little by little, you kind of practice focusing on the positive and very simple, but really these things help me out a lot. And also the exercise of identifying your inner voice and always making sure that your inner voice is super kind. Yeah, yeah, that's what I've been doing. Excellent. <laughs> very much. Um, I'd love to email you at some point as our research is quite close, so that'd be great. Yes. Here, yeah. I'm going to put my email in the chat in case anyone yeah. would like to reach out. Um, and also, marginalized majority is just marginalized majority. So if you ever need to connect to that as well, um, every weekend the services are available. Oral, um, when you come out to the world, um, which is, I call it, the, again, a, a generally whitewashed TikTok concept where you come out and next morning your mom is hugging you and the whole household's like, oh, hey, everyone loves you, you're queer. Um, that doesn't really happen in our Global South family. So I don't use the term coming out anymore. I use coming in because it's about how, who you bring into your sacred, sacred circle of safety and trust, who you bring into it. And that is based on your emotional intuition. And that is based on what you feel on the inside. So bring in people to your sacred space. You never have to expose yourself to the outside world. Okay, I am going to, I think we only have two minutes left and I'm going to end the session with a few healing thoughts as I like to do. So to end this lovely session, um, and I'm going to just reiterate what I have said before. We often become the internal narrative or the internal storyline that we write ourselves into. We often become that. So be aware of what, how you're writing your story in, what your character in the story is. And remember, we are all narcissistic and delusional. All of us. <laughs> so, so if you're writing yourself into your story as the hero, don't let your imposter syndrome kick in and think, oh, you know, this sounds delusional. No, we are all delusional in the way we write in our stories, and it's good to be so. So, again, by the end of the session, I hope you're able to address and allocate your voice, your inner voice, and ask yourself these questions. Is it a kind, forgiving voice or a critical, ruthless voice? Do you give yourself the credit on a daily basis for your journey, for your power, for your thrival? Or does that voice constantly remind you of what is lost versus what is present? Is that voice the voice of a victim? The voice of a person who's unlucky all the time? Or the voice of the learner? Is your inner voice your own worst critic? And here's a good question. Do your choices come 
from a mental state of choicelessness and scarcity? I put it in the chat. Or do your choices come from a mental state of choicefulness and abundance? The narratives and thoughts you have about yourself, most of the time, even before you sleep, will often become the reality of your morning. So remember, you are the hero and the lead of your own story. And let your queer adult self today hug and kiss your younger, queer, innocent, unheard, childlike queer self. Close your eyes after the session. Imagine yourself at 11 years old, at eight years old, at 15. Hug yourself, kiss yourself. Tell yourself, look at me now. Look at where I've become. And know that you are the hero and idol of your inner queer child. Thank you, everybody. And please do not hesitate to reach out to me or to marginalized majority. Thank you so much, Chad. That was absolutely fantastic. Thank you for, for sharing your time with us. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, I need to go back to work. <laughs> Thank you so Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you.